All right, everyone, we're going to talk about anaerobic digestion. So uh, first of all, what is anaerobic digestion? What does it look like? It can come in many different forms. So if you see the picture all the way at the right here, this large picture, that's actually the inside of an anaerobic digester. So you can see the impellers. Um, and you can also kind of see the curved roof, if you will. And um, they come in all different shapes and sizes, so you can even have kind of a, a square type as well, but a lot of them will have these domed roofs, um, and that's because they're capturing biogas production, and it's um, one of the more steady or stable uh, types of architecture to be able to capture uh, biogas that can create pressure. So what does it look like inside when we have uh, anaerobic digestion actually taking place? Uh, first, um, we have what's called the mixing zone at the bottom, and so that's usually where our impellers are actually mixing and uh, creating a, a, a well-mixed zone. And above that, we start to see some sludge that kind of settles. Um, so these are solids that are not quite um, involved in the mixing zone at the bottom. And then above that, we'll have like a fluid zone. So there will be particles and things like that there, but It'll be mostly fluid. And then of course, up at the top, we have biogas. And so um, there's different um, inlets and, and so on. So here we have um, some substrate coming in to the bottom here, uh, being mixed, uh, producing sludge. Um, and then it has to um, go up through the fluid zone for the effluent to come out. And then of course, the biogas is released to the headspace where we capture our effluent biogas. Okay, so the goals of anaerobic digestion are pretty much solids reduction and energy recovery. And uh, we can treat a number of different wastewaters with anaerobic digestion. Typically, we need to have sort of high strength wastewater um, in some form. So uh, waste activated sludge from secondary clarification is uh, often used because it's a um, very concentrated form of organics. Um, sometimes brewery wastewater, domestic wastewater, if it's a you know high concentrated wastewater, um, as well as industrial wastewater and, and landfill leachate. So there's a number of different advantages and disadvantages. Um, so advantages are that uh, there's very little energy requ required. Um, so we're really just um, putting in energy for mixing and we can produce methane so we can actually recover energy. Uh, small reactor volumes typically required because uh, we want to have high strength wastewater and um, fewer nutrients are required, uh, less biological sludge production. And um, recall that our yield uh, for anaerobic processes is much lower than our, our biomass yield for aerobic processes. And so that's one of the large benefits of anaerobic digestion and the reason that we can achieve solids reduction in the system. There's some disadvantages, um, for example, longer startup time because of slow biomass growth. So recall that uh, it takes a lot of uh, redox reactions to occur under anaerobic conditions. So if we're doing fermentation or for example, sulfate reduction, uh, the microorganisms are not getting as much energy as they would if they were doing an aerobic process or aerobic respiration. So because of that, mm -hmm. they have uh, less uh, biomass growth. Um, and so it takes a little bit longer, um, quite a bit longer actually to start up a system. Can also uh, have issues with alkalinity. Um, so pH is very important to control. Um, typically, we see a release of biological nitrogen and phosphorus, so we're really um, actually producing ammonia and phosphate, and so um, that will be present in the effluent, and so we're really not able to achieve biological nitrogen or phosphorus removal. Also, um, we typically don't get um, effluent uh, that is uh, able to meet our discharge requirements straight away. So we have to often uh, have further treatment after the anaerobic process. Uh, sometimes it's very sensitive to low temperatures, so that can be an issue in colder climates. 
also um, susceptible to upsets due to toxic substances. And then there's a potential for production of odors and corrosive gases, uh, probably the most common one being hydrogen sulfide. And that's because all of the sulfur that's in um, the substrate will become reduced over time. So if you put sulfate in, it will be reduced to hydrogen sulfide. Um, any sort of sulfur and biomass um, or organics will also have that fate as well. Okay, so anaerobic digestion itself has multiple different processes that take place. First of all, we have hydrolysis in which complex organic compounds like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are converted into simple uh, organic compounds. And um, these are sugars, amino acids, and fatty acids. That's hydrolysis, and that's sort of an extracellular process that takes place. And then following that, we have acidogenesis, in which these um, simple organic compounds are converted to organic acids and alcohols. And then next, we have acetogenesis, in which hydrogen CO2 is produced from these organic acids and alcohols, as well as acetate. And although we can have some interconversion between these, um, we uh, typically uh, consider the next phase to be methanogenesis in which acetates converted into CO2 and methane and um, similarly hydrogen and CO2 is utilized uh, to, to produce methane. So what do we have coming out of our anaerobic digestion? Typically a biogas mixture that has CO2, methane, and trace gases and um, we also have a liquid digestate that also contains some biosolids. So if we think about our uh, biogas for a minute, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit, but based on the mean oxidation state of the carbon that's going into the system as this complex organic compound, um, if we look at what the, that mean oxidation state of that carbon would be for the substrate, we can determine how much uh, percentage of methane and CO2 we will get out in the end. And so uh, we can predict our oxidation state of our carbon based on COD and total organic carbon of the system. And we can also use this equation here that shows uh, the percentage of methane estimated based on the, or the oxidation state of the carbon uh, that's going into the system. So um, again, uh, we have you know, another viewpoint here that kind of takes a look at um, the different uh, conversions of these different components and the physiological groups of the microorganisms. So we have for um, this conversion and uh, this conversion, this conversion and this conversion, we have hydrolytic, fermentative, and acidogenic bacteria. For number two, uh, we have our uh, hydrogen producing acetogenic bacteria. For number three, with the, which is this inner conversion here, we have uh, hydrogen consuming or hydrogenotrophic acetogenic bacteria, meaning they take hydrogen and CO2 and produce acetate. And then uh, number four here is our hydrogenotrophic methanogens. And then number five is our acetoclastic uh, methanogens. So uh, the major bacterial groups and reactions are shown here. So first we have you know, our hydrolysis, um, and that's where we uh, break down the cellulose, starch, proteins, and lipids into smaller pieces. And then there is fermentation in which we take um, basically these simple soluble organics and sort of tear them apart so that one part of it can act as a an electron acceptor and one can act as one part can act as an electron donor and so that's really what our fermentation is next we have hydrogen producing acetogenic bacteria um, and they convert um, these uh, fatty acids other than acetate basically into uh, acetate which is kind of our our base uh, fatty acid if you will so they take kind of the larger fatty acids, longer chained fatty acids, and convert them into these shorter chain, chains and acetate um, type of uh, fatty acids. And we have the hydrogen consuming acetogenic bacteria. So they take the hydrogen and the CO2 and convert that to acetate. 
We have carbon dioxide reducing or hydrogenotrophic methanogens that take hydrogen and CO2 and convert that to methane. And then finally, we have the acetoclastic methanog methanogens that take our acetate and convert that to methane and CO2. So to take uh, just kind of a quick look at this first step um, of hydrolysis, this is an extracellular process. So that means that it takes place outside of the cell of the microorganism. And that's because most of these compounds are too large for them to import into their cell. And so they need to break it down with extracellular enzymes prior to being able to metabolize it. Uh, so we have some specialized bacterial species that do this. Um, they're typically considered hydrolytic and they're often also fermentative. So they don't really get much from doing the hydrolytic part. Um, they just are um, able to utilize the products of hydrolysis for fermentation. So oftentimes they're doing um, hydrolysis in order to uh, move to the next um, you know, fermentative. So the second step uh, we're going to talk about is acidogenesis. And so if they're, um, so in this case, um, you know, you can have two different types of um, acidogenesis reactions. And one is in which no hydrogen's formed. And so in this case, there's no waste stabilization. The electrons are just kind of redistributed among the various or organics. And so there's really a no total uh, no decrease in the total COD. Um, so uh, you would see a drop in total organic carbon due to the fact that it's producing CO2, that CO2 is re being removed, but recall that CO2 has no COD itself. So there's really no decrease in COD if um, this type of reaction occurs. Now another type um, is in which uh, hydrogen is formed and since it is gaseous and can escape from the medium, this does result in COD reduction in the liquid phase. And so you can see here uh, some of the conversions of how much hydrogen uh, and, you know, loss would cause how much uh, loss in COD. So, uh, one thing to note, however, is hydrogen is consumed uh, by several types of bacteria. And so there's very little free hydrogen that's produced under normal conditions that can leave uh, the system. So oftentimes that hydrogen is consumed so fast by those other bacteria that it doesn't have time to reach the headspace of our uh, anaerobic digester. Okay, finally, our last step is methanogenesis, and that is where we have uh, fermentation of things like acetate, and we have CO2 respiration. So uh, the main products here are CO2 and methane, and methane is very, very insoluble, uh, so it's easy to remove from the liquid phase. Uh, none of the microorganisms really utilize it because it's the most reduced form of a single carbon uh, compound and so there's nothing um, nowhere for it to go so it just uh, comes to the headspace of the reactor and there we collect it for energy recovery so this last process this methane production is what is really the goal of anaerobic digestion because that is what gives us waste stabilization so the methane produced is equal to a, the decrease in COD in this case. So um, the only way that we remove that COD is through the removal of methane um, from this methanogenesis process. And so we note that um, one mole of methane under standard temperature and pressure, which is in this case uh, zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, represents about 64 grams of COD. And so uh, what we can expect is that if uh, for each gram of COD that is consumed or removed from our anaerobic digestion, we should expect to see 350 milliliters of methane that is produced. Now note that this is at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. So oftentimes, um, actually every time, that is not what we're operating at. So we need to do an adjustment with our PV equals NRT equation, or P1 V1 equals over T1 equals P2 T2 over V2. Um, and so we need to use that to do, um, you know, conversion from this milliliters at zero degrees Celsius to whatever temperature that we're operating at.
Okay, so there's a couple different methods of methane generation. So first of all, uh, we're going to talk about CO2 reduction. So this is where we're taking hydrogen, for example, and CO2 and creating methane. Um, we can also have other compounds that are utilized along with CO2 uh, to be able to produce methane at the end. So we've got these three reactions, which are pretty common reactions to occur. And um, although, uh, you know, acetate's not used by the, um, you know, hydrogen utilizing bacteria, it can be used as a terminal electron acceptor. So we can have this equation number four as well that occurs. So one thing to note here is that this um, 3A equation right here, note that the delta G is positive. And so that means that under those standard conditions as written, it would not proceed um, you know, to produce uh, this acetate from, um, you know, uh, in this direction. So it would not proceed as written, basically. And so the, the only way that we can get it to proceed as written is if we get this hydrogen to be so low of a concentration that this delta G then uh, becomes positive. So this is the delta G not at standard conditions um, under you know for this reaction but under non-standard conditions if we have really low hydrogen you know uh, concentration we can push this reaction to have a negative uh, delta g and um, allow it to proceed as written and so one of the things that's um, really important is this 3b reaction where other microorganisms these methanogens pick up this hydrogen and they utilize it so quickly that they can reduce the concentration of hydrogen available to make this uh, 3a reaction proceed as written so it's called an interspecies uh, hydrogen transfer and it is really key to being able to um, allow the first reaction 3a to occur um, and so uh, they these two microorganisms you know work really closely in tandem to be able to um, to accomplish that okay we also have methyl group reduction um, this is where we have say a methyl group that's on a compound and um, they pull that off and create uh, CO2 and methane with it. Um, so this can occur also in, in the digester as well. And so this is, um, you know, we can see things like acetate, propionate, and other things um, that can, you know, produce methane in this manner. Okay, so um, we, I just wanted to show you this. Um, this is an interesting graph that shows, you know, the difference between carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And this, on the bottom axis here is our solids retention time in days, and then our yield. So this is the grams VSS uh, per gram COD removed. And um, you can see that you get a higher yield for carbohydrates, a lower yield for proteins, and an even lower yield for fats. And so um, so uh, you can take a look at you know, where your retention time, your solids retention time is, and see that the longer solids retention time gives you a lower yield. And so that is actually a good thing because um, you know, we would like to have a low yield. That means that we'll end up with lower sludge at the end to take care of. However, um, we're kind of balancing it with the fact that if we have a longer solids retention time, we often need to build a larger reactor to um, be able to accommodate that if we're doing a CSTR type system. So there's two different types of anaerobic digestion that, that are commonly talked about. There's mesophilic, and that takes place um, com most commonly at around 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. And you can see that these are the kind of um, different parameters that we typically will um, assume for a mesophilic digester. And then thermophilic digesters, um, usually around 55 to 60 degrees Celsius, so they're oftentimes heated, so that whereas the mesophilic, um, any sort of temperature, you know, above atmospheric temperature is usually due to some of the biological reactions. But in a thermophilic digester, we often have to heat that so that uh, we can achieve that higher temperature. And the reason we do that is, number one, uh, we can get a faster conversion of our waste and more methane production. And so you can see down here also that um, with a higher temperature, we can reduce our SRT, our minimum SRT. So 
uh, you know, here we're assuming a safety factor of 2.5 for our SRT design, but you can see that it goes all the way from 25 days that we would have to hold that waste in the anaerobic digester under 20 degrees Celsius. It goes all the way down to six days uh, solids retention time for a mesophilic digester or thermophilic, excuse me, thermophilic digester at 55 to 60 degrees Celsius. So. Uh, we could make our systems a lot smaller if uh, we have them at, as thermophilic. However, we do have to put some energy into it. Um, so there's a little bit of a, a trade-off there as far as um, which type of system we would use. Um, so a little bit more in the temperature. Um, this is our mesophilic. So we can see these are, um, this is our SRT minimum. So this is our minimum SRT, uh, meaning the SRT that we cannot go below um, without washing out our microorganisms. And so, um, you know, of course, we're going to be operating at, you know, probably, you know, two and a half times what that SRT minimum is. But we can look at this as sort of a, you know, an, an idea of what, um, which uh, systems um, operate in which ways. So we see our mesophilic um, rather high. Um, and then it starts to go up again once we get past, say, 35 degrees Celsius. So that's why uh, typically you don't see anything in between the 35 degrees Celsius mesophilic uh, digester and the 55 degree thermophilic digester, because you can see that there's this dip. And so there's a minimum, minimum SRT for both of these. And of course, thermophilic much lower, so we can get a much shorter SRT for that. Um, however, most uh, municipal digesters are mesophilic because the energy costs um, can sometimes outweigh the cost savings or the um, you know, benefit from being able to have a smaller digester and have faster kinetics. But uh, one thing with the thermophilic is that we can get pathogen deactivation and control. So for example, we can have pathogen removal and produce what's called class A biosolids in which we were able to land apply the resulting biosolids um, onto fields for agriculture and um, fertilization uh, purposes. Um, of course, once, you know, there, we do have the, the drawback that, you know, we reduce our microbial diversity in these thermophilic digesters. Mm -hmm. So that often means that we have less stability. So they're a little bit more difficult to operate. Um, and, you know, you have to um, have tighter controls on them to make sure that uh, you don't lose the stability. Okay, so uh, some of the requirements and control for these systems. Um, when one of the most uh, you know common things that we we care about is gas composition, and we can get this based on stoichiometry or COD and TOC values. Um, one of the easiest ways is to kind of look at the mean oxidation state of the carbon that's going into the system. So if we looked at a wastewater uh, you know composition, um, we could be able to calculate what the COD and the TOC, which is total organic carbon is. And using that ratio, we can calculate what the mean oxidation state is. And um, the methane production or the methane percentage that's going to be produced then can be calculated using this formula used that um, takes into account that mean oxidation state of the carbon. So down here we have an example that goes through the conversion of uh, glucose to methane and carbon dioxide and calculates um, both the, the mean oxidation state and the uh, expected percent methane that would result. And here we see for um, you know, if this wastewater was represented by the glucose uh, formula that we would get out 50% methane. And so, of course, then the remainder we, you know, we assume to be CO2. There are going to be some trace gases involved as well, like hydrogen and sulfide, but those typically represent less than 1%. And so oftentimes we just consider the methane and CO2 percentages. So this is uh, the graph that I showed you earlier. And so this is the composition of um, the digestion gas. And so up here, if we had a mean oxidation state of carbon coming in as negative four, we would expect to see 100% methane and 0% CO2. 
But if we look at uh, what it takes to have a mean oxidation state of carbon at negative four, that is the mean oxidation state of the carbon in methane. So of course, if we put in methane, we'll have 100% methane. Um, but what we see is that if we continue down this graph, um, our, our fats produce the most amount of methane. Um, and then we have proteins followed by carbohydrates and um, some other types of acids um, that produce more CO2 than methane. And that's important because uh, we can adjust sometimes the substrate that goes into these digesters. So for example, um, oftentimes uh, municipalities will go and collect fat, oil, and grease or fog from different restaurants and say, you know, take it out of grease traps, for example, and put that into the anaerobic digester because it increases uh, the quantity of fats there. So it, it's shifting our mean oxidation state of carbon to more negative uh, values. And because of that, that results in a higher concentration of methane um, and a lower concentration of CO2 coming out. So this is another example. Um, this uh, looks at the conversion of domestic wastewater to methane and carbon dioxide plus biomass. So uh, previously we were talking about, um, you know, the theoretical, uh, you know, CO2 and methane percentage based on the fact that, um, you know, we had no, you know, we were not considering biomass uh, production. So here we have biomass production considered. So this is our full equation here. Uh, with our biomass, so our C5H7O2N, and uh, we can do the same steps. So we can still figure out um, our methane percentage as, say, for example, 70%. Um, and that's based, this is our stoichiometric based um, method, but we can also do it based on our COD and TOC values. Uh, so here uh, we can calculate our oxidation state, our mean oxidation state of the carbon being negative one. And then um, we can go and calculate what percentage methane we'd expect. And here, um, you know, we're close, um, but these two methods do result in slightly different um, predictions for the methane production. So, um, you know, with our... Uh, you know, with our uh, different values here, um, you know, we have to take that into account when we, uh, you know, look, do our design for our anaerobic digester. So this is an interesting um, graph uh, that I wanted to provide to you. So it is um, able to predict, for example, your bicarbonate alkalinity, um, and it, it relates really your bicarbonate alkalinity in your anaerobic digester with your CO2 partial pressure. And is, um, your pH is also considered as well. So if, for example, you have a digester with a pH of 7, you're going to be following this line right here. And based on the CO2 partial pressure, so say our CO2 partial pressure is 0.3, we can follow this over and see where it connects with our uh, pH 7 line, pull this down, and this will give us our bicarbonate alkalinity in grams per liter as CaCO3. So this is a really handy chart. Um, we can use this in multiple different ways. So if we know, for example, the CO2 partial pressure in the bicarbonate alkalinity, we can predict what our pH is going to be or you know, other uh, combinations of that as well. So uh, one of the things that matters um, in our anaerobic digester is our oxidation reduction potential. And that uh, really tells us how reducing the conditions are in the digester. So if we have things like sulfate or nitrate, um, that raises our oxidation reduction potential and it can uh, make it difficult or kind of inhibit some of the anaerobic digestion that occurs. So it not only channels electrons away from methane production because then we start doing nitrate reduction and sulfate reduction, but um, it also uh, decreases the methane content in the gas and um, some of these intermediates can be inhibitory as well as sulfide um, itself being inhibitory. So if we have too much sulfate production or sulfate reduction going on, uh, we may get to inhibitory concentrations. 